Cellular Reproduction, Chapter 16. This is Rudolf Virchow. This is Rudolf Virchow. In the mid-19th century, his microscope observations of cells dividing led him to propose a radical new theory. New cells arise from the division of other cells. This theory flew in the face of the accepted science of the time, spontaneous generation. Life would simply appear at God's will from non-living matter. Obviously, this heretic had to be burned at the stake, if not for some of the other contributors to cell theory around that time. So cells then arise from pre-existing cells. All living things are composed of one or more cells. Theodore Schwann came up with this one. You have to remember that this was during a time that used state-of-the-art microscopes that could magnify no better than about 220 times. During the course of the 19th century, improvements to the way lenses were ground were being made that made scientists more confident about proposing new theories. Cells are the smallest unit of life and are the basic units of structure and function in all organisms. This is actually a couple of theories combined. Once the idea of cells were forwarded to the modern scientific community, people still assumed that plant cells were fundamentally different from the cells of humans. But observations of bacteria, plant, animal cells showed that the basic premise of a cell, its structure and function, had a lot in common. The activity of the entire organism depends on the total activity of its independent cells. When German biologist Walter Fleming used dyes to bring up the contrast of once transparent cellular structures, organelles, the most luminous of these he called chromatin, meaning colored matter. While some organelles appear in some organisms and not others, it turns out all cells of all organisms have chromatin. As we'll find out later in this course, chromatin directs the cell's function. The combined action of all the cells in an organism literally makes the organism so much more than the sum of its parts. This is one of those good to know things, but have you ever wondered why cells are so small? Why don't cells just grow and grow so we're made up of a few big cells instead of trillions upon trillions of tiny cells? So as you may already know, Cells take in nutrients and excrete wastes via its plasma membrane. If a cell gets bigger, it will require more nutrients and excrete more wastes. It will need a plasma membrane that has a surface area that will increase at the same rate as its volume. But as you can see from these diagrams, that just isn't the case. When a cell gets bigger, the surface area of the plasma membrane doesn't increase proportionally. The chromosome. Chromatin is the genetic material in the nucleus of a cell, a nucleic acid called DNA. For reasons that will be discussed later, the molecule DNA is responsible for an organism's characteristics. It is a nucleic acid, and along its length, its individual molecules are arranged in such a way to spell out a code that is read by the cell that instructs the cell to perform functions like making hormones, synthesizing proteins, or even dividing. There can be hundreds or even thousands of coded groupings along the length of one strand of DNA, and humans have 46 different strands. Each coded group is called a gene, and these genes are not only in the parent cell, but also the daughter cells once the cell is divided. If the cells were to divide to make sperm cells, these genes would be passed on to offspring, should one of the sperm cells fertilize an egg cell. Genes are the genetic codes found on the strands of DNA. Genes make up the genetic code of the organism and is passed down from one generation to the next. Wrap the DNA around a bunch of proteins called histones and we get a strand of chromatin. Much of the time, this is how DNA appears in the nucleus when it's not dividing. When the cell needs to divide, the DNA replicates so that when two cells result, each cell has an identical complement of DNA. Following replication, all this DNA needs to ultimately be split so the daughter cells can get the proper amount of DNA.
so it needs to organize its chromatin into nice packages so they're easier to move around the cell. The chromatin supercoils into short, thick, stubby structures called chromatids. Each chromatid has an identical chromatid because of DNA replication. The two chromatids are joined to the special region called the centromere. So prior to cell division, the chromatin replicates, then supercoils into short, thick structures called chromatids. The chromatids are arranged in pairs, connected at a position along their length called the centromere. All somatic cells contain 46 different chromosomes. Immediately prior to cell division, following DNA replication, there will be 92 chromatids. They will be paired to their duplicate at the centromere, forming 46 pairs of sister chromatids. These 46 chromosomes are actually 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. 23 came from mum, and 23 came from dad. In actuality, only females have 23 homologous pairs. Males have 22 homologous pairs, plus an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Recall females are XX, while males are XY, referring to the letter assignments given to the two sex chromosomes. The homologous chromosomes are not identical like the sister chromatids. Imagine one of the stripes in this picture of a chromatid represents a certain sequence of DNA molecules. That sequence, say, would code for eye color. We would refer to this sequence as a gene, the gene for eye color. The specific sequence of DNA molecules in the gene on this chromosome actually codes for blue eye color. On the homologous chromosome that came from the other parent, the same gene position exists, but this one, say, codes for brown eyes. So the gene codes for a general characteristic, like eye color, but the specific DNA sequence at the position that codes for a specific eye color is referred to as an allele. Genes can have many different alleles. We'll revisit genes and alleles in more detail later. In the meantime, geneticists can pair up homologous chromosomes by visual indicators. Homologous chromosomes are identified as paired due to the same characteristics length, banding pattern, and centromere position. Why the need to pair them up? A geneticist can take a sample of amniotic fluid from a pregnant woman, for example, and analyze the cells found sloughed off from the fetus. All cells found in the amniotic fluid belong to the fetus. Using computer-assisted microscopy, a geneticist can assess the chromosomal health of the fetus by performing a karyotype. The homologous chromosomes are paired and the banding patterns are color enhanced for clarity. They are numbered 1 to 22 in descending order of size. The sex chromosomes are last. Is this a male or a female karyotype? When you look at each chromosome, what's missing? The sister chromatid. I should point out that the banding patterns are not necessarily genes. You can't actually see genes. The bands merely represent changes in density of the supercoiled DNA at that particular region. Homologous chromosomes have the same genes at the same positions. Genes are specific regions on a chromosome that code for a characteristic, like eye color. Each gene can contain one of several alleles. And alleles code for specific characteristics, for example, blue eye color. Karyotypes are the arrangement for analysis of homologous pairs taken from fetal cells during an amniocentesis. This is a technology usually employed to determine the chromosomal health of a fetus. Geneticists can look for chromosomes that have abnormality, like inverted segments, missing segments, or missing chromosomes, or duplicated segments, or even extra chromosomes. We'll talk more about missing and extra chromosomes later in this unit once we learn how these abnormalities come about.